Okay, this recording is going to be related to chapter 17, part C. Um, I made an extra part here about Fit, Frit, Fritz Pollard, who was the first African-American to integrate NFL football, the National Football League. He would be the first coach, black coach that is, the first African-American black quarterback, as well as a standout star in football for Brown University, um, which had you know challenges at first putting him on the field, but once he was on the field to play, right? Like people say, that's the actually uh, level playing field that we were looking for in real life, you would actually find in athletics, right? Um, say, for example, Joe J Johnson, who was a great boxer, regardless of what races and folks may have felt about him, once you stepped between the rings and he was actually at the time, you know, supported and backed by others, including, you know, others basically mean whites with money and authority, it, there was actually the, 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 the situation where ultimately, you know, your brothers in the KKK and others can't come to save you in the ring by yourself fighting this person as a, as a sport, right? And saying go for anything, football, even hockey, whatever, talent reigns supreme. And so... That's the beautiful thing about athletics and in the 21st century, I think we can see this with the rise of the black athlete over the 20th, now going into the 21st century, where the National Basketball League is basically dominated by African Americans when it wasn't until 1950 that they integrated after Jackie Robinson. A lot of you may find that weird considering the predominance of the black athlete in sports in general, athletics in American history, and especially in basketball, right, which is dominated by African Americans due to just the mental, but also, of course, largely the physical uh, needs that are brought with basketball, right, tall and quick, tall and fast. Uh, and so ultimately, the ability to integrate athletics would start with people like Fritz Pollard, who was actually a standout, as I said, in Ivy League football, uh, and he was able to do something many had not done at that time when the Ivy League, surprise, believe it or not, <laughs> was dominant in athletics, especially football at the time. And he actually was able to lead Brown over both Princeton and Harvard um, in football. And so Anyway, that's the part I want to take a second and add in that I think it would be is appropriate um, as we are, are looking at the NFL football con currently you know being played as I speak across the nation, right? On you know, on this is a Sunday recording. So this is typically NFL Sunday. And I think it's only appropriate that we take time and pay respects in full, right? So your textbook leaves out the pioneers in the NFL as well as basketball, NBA basketball, NFL basketball, and, and NBA basketball. And that's what I was taking the time to supplement. So let's get to Fritz Pollard and then we can move on. And part of also know the motivation as you just all the, see, these slides just before the part about Fritz Pollard is the rise during and after the First World War in the early parts of the 1900s, right, of the 1900s, that basically came out of this notion of scientific racism and there's also this notion of trying to do like what the original KKK, KKK did in 1866 when it was formed, which is trying to reduce, stop, you know, retard uh, African American achievement and growth in, in beneficial ways, right? Men came back from World War One and they wanted like they would after World War Two. And other black Americans wanted to be treated fairly at home, 
right? After World War II, there's something that's going to be called the Double V Campaign. The victory, victory event stood for victory against fascism abroad and racism at home. And unfortunately, I'm recording this in 2020, and we still are now and then not large, large community-led kind of uh, oppression, but you have individuals, which you always will, I guess, attacking soldiers, right? Attacking African Americans that have showed a commitment to helping this country carry out, and I'll put it frankly, carry out its neo-colonial um, goals at times, right? Because this is the 21st century. There's, if there's no say, quote, quote, Adolf Hitler and the rise of nationalist socialism, right? It, there's no real need for the, so many wars and attacks but it has a lot to do with the increase in American, you know, um, interest in being a global player in the in the, the colonial sense <clears throat> because of the economic benefits. But anyway, going all the way back to World War One, there was a situation where in America there was not much distribution of wealth. Uh, blacks were seen as Jim Crow era as being mistreated, and so. One area where area where Black Americans were making inroads in terms of at least other fellow competitors respected them was in athletics, right? Intellectually, yes, the voice, but then you had some people who bought into this idea in the Black community of, of Booker T. Washington, right? Of not challenging whites intellectually and polit politically, but within sports, Black athletes were often mistreated, taunted. Uh, and, you know, and a lot of time coaches, even in the Big Ten, which is interesting considering that's where national champions such as Michigan, well, I'm sorry, uh, Michigan State and other top schools such as all of them, Wisconsin, Illinois, right, which interestingly is named after the line, the Illinois Indigenous Native American group, right, they call themselves the Fight in the Illini. Uh, you have Indiana, you have all these black athletes that have benefited uh, basically white America, European dominated America, but oftentimes there's conspiracy a hundred years ago to not allow blacks to participate in sports, right? And so even at times, some schools, some all white teams refuse to um, play against black teams. So white supremacy is definitely um, at the core of this divide and yeah, so in in Fritz Pollard, we get to see here a gentleman who contributed great things and did uh, on the field and later off the field. Right, you'd actually learn that he was actually very um, important in the in the Harlem Renaissance, and he went on to do great things. So let me let. Let's see, make sure we have it right. Let me let this documentary tell the story more fully. Okay. Watch on YouTube. Yes, let's do that because it will blow up and you can see it in more detail than if we try to just watch it. Let's see. Okay. So let's share screen. Make sure you're seeing the share. <clears throat> Excuse me. It is okay. So should be winding up. And these are some really uh, informative vi video that you share sound. Golden age of sport. Okay, but only so this is about Fritz Pollard. Okay, all right. For white America, college football was a big city game played with little color. Another version was small towns and dusty sandlots. They called it postgraduate football until a few ragtag teams 
banded together in 1920 to form the National Football League. Here, all the white faces were joined by a single black one. His name was Frederick Douglass Pollard, son of a Native American mother and a West Indian father, raised in a German suburb of Chicago where they called him Fritz. He was one of a kind. He was a, a pioneer. One of the things uh, he first did was to uh, appear in the, uh, in the Rose Bowl game. The first game in 1916. He was the first black to make Walter Camp's uh, All-American. He was the first black quarterback in the National Football League. He was the first black coach in the National Football League. Then, uh, outside of his football career, he started the first black tabloid in, in New York City in 1935. In Chicago, he had uh, the first black investment firm in the United States. And then uh, he became uh, an agent and he began to represent uh, uh, black entertainers. He achieved so much, it wasn't just football. He was a man on a mission. And I think uh, in his 90 plus years, he attempted and uh, he accomplished so much. I think I'm a very, very fortunate man and I'm still able to get around and very thankful that I'm alive enough to be able to have my picture taken and you gentlemen to come and see me. In 1974, NFL Films visited Fritz. Most of that interview was never used until now. My father was a great champion boxer in the Civil War days. And he learned the barber trade, and he moved up to a place called Rogers Park, way on the north side of Chicago, a suburb of Chicago. Rogers Park was all German. My people were the only blacks in the area. They were the only blacks in the schools. They were Americans, and they were not going to be confined, and they were not going to be marginalized uh, just because uh, their skin happened to be black. When we went out for the football team down at Maine Tech High School, my brother said, hey, where's my kid brother? You haven't given him a chance. He said, well, I'm not going to play unless you give my kid brother a chance to play. So they gave me, because of my brother, they gave me a chance to play in at 89 pounds on this Lane Tech High School football team. In four years, Fritz gained 60 pounds and a place on the Cook County All-Star team, a first for a young man of color. There are people in Chicago talk with my mother and trying to get me to go to Brown University. So it's an interesting kind of history that Almost no blacks were ever allowed to go to, quote, white colleges. So the fact that, that Fritz Pollard didn't had, had done so well is it's extraordinary. Uh, he would break on the scene against Harvard and Yale. And of course, at that time, it's hard to explain today because these teams are not very powerful anymore. They were college football. Pollard, in effect, uh, ran wild uh, against both of them. It was a revelation that this uh, young black man who was uh, so small could do this. Uh, all of a sudden, he went from a very marginal player uh, to uh, one that was getting national recognition. But his dreams were even bigger. He was a hero. My father was a hero. When Brown beat Yale, that was all that they needed to write. Pollard beat Yale. They give him anything he wanted. Anything. One reward was a trip on a cross-country pullman to play in the first ever Rose Bowl. Of course, at that time, it was very unusual for any black person, much less a, a young athlete, to be, be on a Pullman car. The Pullman uh, porters uh, wouldn't serve Pollard. Some of the hotels wouldn't accept him when they got on the West Coast. So it, it was more than just football. It was, uh, it was testing, again, the, the racial barriers that this uh, uh, Rose Bowl game. But it did give him a lot of visibility. Brown lost to Washington that day, but Fritz Pollard had already earned the greater victory. For the first time, a black man could claim the title, All-American. His rise from Rogers Park had been swift, but the biggest challenge lay just ahead. There wasn't any knowledge of pro football to amount to anything at that during those days. It was after I finished at Brown and I went down to University of Pennsylvania and I studied dentistry. And they came to me about playing pro football. And that's the, how I happened to play against Jim Thorpe and 
some of his engines. Naturally, I had heard about the great Jim Thorpe and whatnot, but I imagine he had heard about the great Fred Pollard, because I had a name at that time, too. You know, his mom was a full-blooded Indian. He meets uh, Jim Thorpe on the field, and Thorpe is giving him the once over, looking at him like, who can this guy be, and what are you doing here? And Jim said, hello, little black boy. I said, hello, big black boy. And he looked at me, you know. <laughs> and it stunned uh, Jim Thorpe, because no one ever spoke to him that way. And he said, you're as black as I am. And he said, and I'm as much Indian as you are. I said, well, we're going to play against each other. We'll find out who's going to be the blackest after this game. These weren't Ivy League frat boys across the line. The roustabouts of the NFL were out to teach the young black All-American a lesson. Pro football back in those days was pretty rough. As small as I was, no one had any sympathy for me at all. No one was pulling for him, all pulling against him. And every game was a challenge, one for survival. And the word passed around to fellows that we didn't want blacks in pro football, and let's get him. They used to hit me, one on top, one and below, in order to try to take me out. They're trying to break his legs and hurt his arms and all kinds of stuff. Some of them were a little rough with them, but uh, I didn't think it was a thing to do. And then when they would do it, they would say, well, you little black, I'll get you the next time. Uh, I think he was the most abused of all of them, and he resented it, and he made them pay for it, and I don't blame him. He was good. I look at him and grin. They didn't get mad and want to fight him. Just look, look at him and get grin, and the next minute run 80 yards for a touchdown. Pollard in his youth was a little more arrogant than most of them, but uh, I think he had a reason to be. And I wanted the honor of having been the first black coach more than anything else. Fritz not only held his own, he actually won his enemies over as the player coach of the Akron Pros. Then the coal region of Pennsylvania called. Those fellows came out of the mines and came up to play football. Never went to college. Never saw the inside of a high school. And I said, what kind of a little old town is this anyway? He said, you know black people around and you never see any and whatnot. I said, they're going to give me hell out there. It was a difficult experience for him because, as he said, they had never seen a black man in the coal region. In fact, uh, the first game he played at uh, Weston Field at Shenandoah at halftime, because of threats made against him, uh, his team, which was the, uh, the Gilberton Catamounts, uh, stayed in the middle of the field because they were afraid to get near the fans because somebody might uh, uh, do Fritz Pollard in. But uh, he, like throughout his life, uh, he won respect and admiration of people, even in the coal region. Fritz left pro football just in time to join the Harlem Renaissance of the 1930s. The thing about his career in football and even after football was this whole line of achievement. He moved to New York, he went into coal business, and he moved up to the newspaper business, and he went into the entertainment business, and he was just so persistent and tenacious and charming. The impact of the rights movement from Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta and all that that brought forth a revolution. And the fact that Mr. Pollard was a first in a way in a very quiet revolution, the fact that he was so resilient is extraordinary. And that's what makes him memorable, that he was so resilient. Sadly, Fritz Pollard's efforts on behalf of African-American athletes are just a faded memory. But his story is worth retelling, if only to introduce the players of today to the man who, 80 years ago, carried the ball for all of them.
age of sport, but only for white America. Okay, a bit more. The Roaring Twenties were not. Known as the Golden Age of Sport. Welcome to a special Black History Month episode of NFL 360. I'm Steve Weich. If we're asked to name the first African-American to play modern Major League Baseball, we don't hesitate to answer. But if we're asked to name the first African-American to play and coach professional football, most of us don't know. And it's time we did. Because long before Jackie Robinson, there was Fritz Pollard. Join us now as Nate Burleson leads us on a journey to rediscover a forgotten man. Burleson. For 11 years, I lived the dream by playing in the National Football League. Now I spend the better part of my days living a different dream. Over the course of 38 years, I've lived my best life. That's been my journey so far. Part of my journey moving forward is understanding my past. As the NFL celebrates its 100th anniversary, and looking back at the start of the NFL, one face jumped out, a black face. So I'm only gonna show a few moments of this. As you can see, this is actually a, a hour long documentary. I have here also a two minute and 36 second um, vid that I'm gonna actually show, but I figured I'd give a little flavor of this documentary that I would like you to watch. And that's something I must do as a, common practice is to just give a little preview all the time, not just tell you to watch it, but tantalize you into watching it by showing a, a bit of it. A face not too different from mine. This is my journey to shed a light on the life of Fritz Pollard, to come to grips on why this man was forgotten and to show the world who this man really was. He was a revolutionary. He broke down tremendous barriers. Phenomenal running back, hard to corral. An extraordinary player. He was extremely quick. The Barry Sanders of his day. Walter Camp, the name associated with the first real All-America compilation. It said something to the effect that Fritz Pollard ran faster than anybody his eyes had ever seen. Touchdown, in the ball game is over. 
When Fritz had the ball in his hands, something exciting was about to happen. He could throw the ball almost as well as anybody in the very, very infancy of pro football. Not the biggest guy in the world, but tough. And he understood that toughness meant not only on the field, but in society generally. Well, when you consider what American history was at that point in time, it was almost unthinkable, unfathomable that Mr. Fritz Pollard would be doing what he was doing. Probably would be not known by too many individuals in America today, but he was one of the greatest running backs that ever lived. There you go, high praise, right, from Jim Brown, who's probably one of the, definitely one of the greatest running backs ever. So the fact that, you know, Fitz Pollard um, does not get depressed, that has more to do with, you know, unfortunately in a lot of things in general in American society, um, this idea of, a new game. of substance, Oh, well, actually, I should say substance over over basically hype has been lost in general in American society, and Fritz Pollard was definitely a man of substance and accomplishment. So let's see a small, short video, and that will conclude this supplemental component for Chapter 17, Part C. And I thought it was only accurate and then also respectful in terms of African-American history and also just the sport of football, which, of course, I hold dear. Well, not of course, you don't know that, but I hold dear uh, just as an athletic pursuit. But then we learned the legacy of people even before Fifth Pollard of, you know, people like Jim Thorpe, right, who was a contemporary. And I love the bit of Jim Thorpe interacting with Fifth Pollard and Fifth Pollard saying, in the response to Jim Thorpe's, I'm not sure where it came from, statement of, hey, little black boy, and he said to him, hey, big black boy, right? Because indigenous or Native Americans, sometimes like African Americans could become caught up and co-opted, basically a la Booker Z. Washington, right? Split allegiance, um, you know, go to, go to school, get educated against your own heritage and culture. And yeah, I'm not sure what exactly Jim Thorpe's um, political, you know, I guess stance was on the spectrum, but I know that he was a great athlete who uh, you know performed well in the 1912 Olympics in Stockholm, played professional football. Uh, I believe was someone to accomplished in field hockey at Carlisle um, School, and so he was definitely an example for America and for Black Americans in particular, right? Like Jesse Owens, who would later be another Olympic historian, was influenced by Jim Thorpe, as was Jim Brown, who himself is in the Hall of Fame for both. No, everyone knows Hall of Fame and football player, but he's also in the College Hall of Fame for lacrosse, which is an indigenous Native American game that was adopted and is played today largely by um, privileged, kind of more upscale areas. Though I was last thing I'll say on that is that in recent years there has been a more of a, a movement uh, thing led by lacrosse players themselves to try and spread lacrosse into urban, uh, inter- I would say city, urban areas, and in particular um, African American communities and. You know, yeah, so I have a personal connection with the cross is I, I know a bit more about how important it is uh, to athletic and American history, going back to the founding of the nation moving forward. But yeah, so let's watch this small bit on Fifth Potter and thank you for checking out part, part C of chapter 17 out of collegiate competition towards a fledgling professional circuit seemed to hold the door open at least a crack for the black athlete. Run! As early as 1920 when the league began there were two players Fritz Pollard and Bobby Marshall uh, who were both African Americans and played in the National Football League but Pollard became the key. Pollard was the one that brought other black players in. 
He kind of bounced around from city to city, as a lot of pros did in the day, and he knew where black players could or should play. Pollard, in addition to being a great player, was also the first African-American coach in the National Football League. Fritz Pollard is the gold standard, really, when you talk about a guy who not only was a coach and a player in the new NFL, but also on the college level, was uh, an amazing star at Brown. He had a lot of speed, and he was tough. And he can take a pound, and he can give it out as well. We suddenly become colorblind when we have a motive. And I think that's what would happen when you would see a Fritz Pollard being given an opportunity to play football. I mean, it wasn't that in the 20s anybody was attempting to break a barrier of any kind. It was really just opportunistic. For all of the legal restrictions on black equality and racial equality, there's contradictions everywhere. Whether it's a school, uh, as in a university or a college team, whether it's a professional team, there's a tremendous economic gain to be made by using black labor. No African-American athlete in the late 19th or early 20th century got to be just an athlete. He had to carry the hopes of an entire community. It's not enough to run fast, to score touchdowns. The key is that you're carrying the burden of race with you. The men that carried that burden, the tiny handful of African-Americans in football in the 1920s, remain the exception. Men like Fritz Pollard, Bobby Marshall, and Paul Robeson remained in the shadows behind names like Lambeau, Grange, and Nagurski. You see him mentioning Paul Robeson there, right? Who would go on to become a quality actor, both on the screen and on the stage, as well as a well-renowned uh, speaker and socialist, open supporter of the Soviet Union. Partly, I think, to 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 excess, right? Because once Stalin comes in and establishes the cruelty that goes along with Stalin rule and communist Russia it really is, uh, like you say, it, it tainted the whole communist movement that started in with the Bolshevik Revolution in 1918. So idea-wise, socialism and communism are, are make sense. But unfortunately, Paul Robes to go on a tangent may, may have uh, not really, you know, fully know what was going on with the cruelty of Stalin. But idealistically, as you're seeing, Socialism is at the heart and the dynamic history of black athletes and other kinds of entertainers is not to be lost, um, you know, by an example of, as you see here, Fritz Pollard, as well as Paul Robeson. And then in the increasingly crowded terrain of American sports, just as professional football gained a modest foothold in the East and Midwest, came that abrupt turn of history that altered everything to come. 